Okay. All right, it's my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Gruber from University of York, and he's talking today about minimal coping complexes and high choice methods. Thank you. It's a pleasure to speak here. Um, so, yeah, I want to talk about a concept that is called highest weight categories, which is sort of omnipresent in lead theory of representation theory. So, examples of highest weight categories are like a category O for a complex simple Lie algebra or Kratmuli algebra or the rational representations of an algebraic groups or the representations of quantum groups that with groups of unity. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, this is a useful concept, and I want to talk about one specific tool that you can use for studying objects in highest weight categories, and that's the minimal fitting complexes from the title. And since this is the, the first uh, of the two talks that I'll be giving, um, today I'm sort of introducing the concept and giving you some, some basic results about minimal fitting complexes, and next time we will see how we can apply them in a concrete setting to study the model structure of the category of rational representations of algebra. Okay. I'll start with the basics, and I'll start by telling you what a highest weight category is. Let's see. So, perfectly. Let's just start by fixing a field A and uh, C A finite length field in category, which is k linear. Uh, and by that, I mean that all the homomorphism spaces in the category are vector spaces um, over this field, and the composition is bilinear. Uh, finite length means that in this abelian category, every object is a finite uh, Jordan Fender series. Okay? Um, and now we make an additional crucial assumption in order to talk about this highest weight categories, and that is that um, we suppose uh, that there's a partially ordered set uh, of statistics, uh, gamma, yes, sorry, whole set. Um, which which labels the the irreducible objects of a category. So, so I'm a map from the set lambda into the objects of the category. Um, say lambda goes to F lambda such that the set L lambda and lambda is precisely a set of representatives for the simple objects in the category after isomorphism. Representatives. Once we once we are in this setup, there's three axioms which make this category a highest weight category. Um, but uh, not not quite. Let me, let me, let me say it differently. So uh, there's there's another uh, notation which we need to need to introduce. So if we um, if we are given a subset uh, gamma of lambda, then we write uh, C gamma for um, the Sayer subcategory of the category we're looking at, where um, the indices of the simple modules that generate the Sayer subcategory are precisely coming from the set gamma. So we take a lambda with lambda and gamma, and the Sayer subcategory generated by that. And what this means is we just look at all the objects of the category with all the composition factors indexed by, by elements from this set. Okay? So this is the smallest extension clause subcategory containing all the lambda where lambda comes to come. Okay? Um, in particular, we're going to write uh, C 
less or equal lambda for the set, uh, well, for, for, for the category C, where we look at all uh, mu that are less or equal than lambda. And we're going to use the same notation C less than lambda um, for the category corresponding to the set or mu with the last two less than lambda. And these notations are going to be important for stationary actions, which is what I want to do now. So we call C isolated category. Um, first, we ask that uh, for all lambda, um, a lambda uh, has a protective cover, delta lambda, a lambda and injective part. Lambda. The important thing is we don't ask that these are protective covers or injective files in the entire category. We actually ask that they are protective covers and injective files in the category. We only look at weights that are less or equal than lambda. Okay. So uh, this is the starting condition, and then of these data we ask some we ask some additional conditions, namely um, first of all. And this is more a condition on the on the weight process. Um, we we ask that uh, for all lambda, um, the set of all mu in lambda, which are below this this given uh, element lambda, so mu, this way for lambda is finite. Now the second axiom is that uh, for lambda and lambda, we have that uh, the home space between the delta lambda and another lambda given by the condition above would be one dimension. This is just a small underlying field. And then there's a third condition which is an extra vanishing condition, which says that um, for any pair of elements of lambda, um, we ask that x1, c, delta lambda, and nabla mu is 0, and so is x2. This is the definition. It's going to be super wide. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a few more notations now. We call uh, lambda less or equal the weight for set of the highest weight category. And um, we call delta lambda the standard object. And nabla lambda the co standard object. Both of highest weight lambda, um, and well, let me let me tell you about some some sort of easy consequences of these definitions. Um, the first one is that uh, home spaces in C are finite dimensional. Um, the reason for that is that if you just look at the home space between two simple modules, um, if the two simple modules have different labels, the home space is going to be zero dimensional. If uh, the labels are the same, then the home space between the simples is going to embed into this home space between delta lambda and another lambda, which is one dimensional. Then you can argue by induction on the length of composition series. Okay? Um, Okay, so another thing is that um, 
basically you have a short exact sequence, zero, Q, lambda, delta lambda, L lambda to zero. And um, if you look at this quotient, then this here is not like the submodule, this is going to belong to the subcategory C strictly less than lambda. So if you look at the structure of the standard module, it's going to have L lambda appearing at the top, and then everything else is going to be strictly below with respect to the partial order. Um, which is the reason why these modules are sort of drawn as a triangle that tells you that look, the, the important thing is sitting at the top, and then there's other, other stuff underneath. And the Kostner module is drawn the other way around because a lambda is sitting at the bottom, then you have more things at the top. Okay. Um, Yeah, the, the reason the reason for this is that delta lambda is a is a projective cover um, of L lambda in inside the um, inside inside this truncate category C less or equal to lambda here, and uh, nabla lambda is an injective hull. If you look at the home space between something and an injective hull, it's going to count the composition multiplicities. Um, so basically, this condition here tells you the thing that I've just that I've just written down. Um, and um, thirdly, so I'm not going to prove this, but uh, you can actually generalize HW2 and not HW2 and HW3 simultaneously uh, by showing that uh, all the X groups between delta lambdas and not the mu's. Um, they they vanish except when lambda is equal to mu and i is equal to zero. Just k if lambda is equal to mu, i is equal to zero, and it's zero otherwise. Okay, so that's that's the basics of of weight categories, and uh, so this is a bit dry and. Category theoretical, I guess. So I'm going to give you some some examples you can keep in mind. Sorry. So can you, can you like explain how this definition came up, and also like this is not the original definition. This is not the original definition, but it's equivalent to the original definition. Uh, well, the original definition um, is. Well, that, yeah, yeah. In, it's not in quite. under 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 some finiteness assumptions. So I think. The, the point is about highest weight categories, there's many different conventions of working with them. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I wouldn't say this is one that is particularly convenient to work with filtering objects. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one that, uh, well, it makes all the examples that I'd be interested in later on work. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't cover GRT models? Um, it does not. But the original definition does. Yeah. But then I think so the original definition doesn't cover some other things that you may be interested in in situations. Like um, for example, um, I think the original definition requires the existence of injective hulls uh -huh. in the entire category. Which for example, if you look at finite dimensional rational representations of algebraic groups, this is not going to work. Right. This definition covers finite dimensional rational representations. The original definition covers all rational representations, but yes. not finite dimensional ones. Yes. Right. So um, and we should, you should mention the original definition of the quantum portion. Yes, yes, the original definition. So I think I said this in the abstract. I forgot to say it just now. So this is a concept that was introduced by Klein, Parsons, Scott in order to encapsulate all the examples that I'm going to mention now. Um, into sort of one abstract framework in order to not have to reprove things mm -hmm. all over again every time we come up with a new highest weight category. Mm -hmm. And so the the key example, which maybe was not the original motivation, actually I think the original motivation was rational representations of algebraic groups. Right. Um, but the the most basic example still is that if we take uh, G a complex simple D algebra. Um, and in there, we fix a real subalgebra and the Kartman subalgebra. Um, 
Okay. Um, then we can look at the category O, which is by definition the finitely generated uh, D modules, which are locally B finite. Which means that every vector in a module is going to be contained in a finite dimension in B submodule. Uh, and they have an H weight space decomposition. Okay, so this is a very sort of classical category to study representations of, of Lie algebras. And, um, and um, when you're looking at this category, then you can define for all lambda in, uh, in the dual of the Cartan stuff algebra, uh, there is a Burma module delta lambda, and a dual Burma module nabla lambda. And then um, there's a simple module of highest weight lambda, which is the unique simple quotient of the Verma module and the unique simple submodule of the coast of the, of the, of the dual Verma module. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and um, so one might be tempted to, to say that O is the highest weight category, which in principle is, except there's one thing that doesn't quite work in terms of the axioms that I wrote down, uh, and that's this condition about finiteness of the partial order. So there is a natural partial order uh, on on this set by the positive roots coming from from B, but it doesn't. It is not going to have this finiteness condition. And so in order to get this finiteness condition, we need to sort of apply a small trick. We need to go down to the blocks of category O, which are going to have finite back four sets. Mm -hmm. So we go. Um, so in order to do this. Uh, we need a little bit more notation, and I, I, I'm going through this because this is going to be a running example, and I'm going to show you some uh, some examples of the of the key concepts of this talk in this setting later. Um, so uh, let's also say that W is the bile group of this Lie algebra, and um, five plus the set of positive roots. Of algebra B and um, rho is one half times the sum of all the positive roots. So, um, with this notation in place, um, we say that rho. The stair stuff category is generated by all L of W of rho minus rho on the W. Uh, and this is of the block. So, as before, the stair stuff category means you take the smallest extension closed subcategory that contains all of these simple modules. And the thing that we do here is, basically we start from the weight zero, which you get if you put W equal to one, just pick rho minus rho. And then you act on this weight by the so-called dot action, which is where you shift the origin down to the point minus rho. And then it's just, just a group action with the origin centered at minus rho instead of centered at zero. Okay. Uh, so these are essentially all just simple modules whose highest weights have the same W always method of um, and so, yes, why I'm telling you this, the ten, the, I'm telling you this because no, this is uh, a highest weight category. And uh, there's a very nice weight for set, uh, which is just the wild root set. So this is 
w less or equal, and uh, less or equal is the third order. Um, there's one subtlety here, um, and that is the labeling. So if we like, we don't want to label the, the simple modules by just calling this one LW. We want to start at the, at the opposite end of the process. So we want to start at minus two rho and this year, like the, the, the simple module, which is labeled by zero, is going to be at the top of the process. So, um, two or daughter, um, where we write uh, LW. L uh, minus W of rho minus rho delta W is equal to delta minus W of rho minus rho and now W is equal to minus W of rho minus rho. Okay, so if you, if you label the Verma modules and the dual Verma modules and the simple modules like this, then there is this vector X of super mm -hmm. All right, um, let's make it a bit more concrete and look at the example of SL3, which I've written on the board over there. Um, so in that case, um, uh, the value group is going to be the dihedral group with six elements. Um, I've drawn for you here the system of value chambers. If you label, like if you, like if this dot here is the weight zero and the center of the axis is going to be minus rho, then you can see that if you reflect this point around, then you get the other points that have gone on the plane. Um, and the labeling of the weights that I've written down on the board um, forces you to, well, basically the, the identity now corresponds to minus two rho, and then you start going up. So the way that the labels are precisely as I've drawn them in the channel scene, okay? And now the structure of the Verma modules in in the principal block of category of category O for SL3 is given precisely as I've drawn over here. So the Verma module uh, corresponding to E is just simple. Um, and the Verma module corresponding to S and T, they both have two composition factors, S sitting at the top, like L of S sitting at the top, L of E sitting at the bottom. And well, as you can see below, um, the modules get a bit more complicated. So in this in these diagrams, um, the top layer is always sort of the the top of the module and the, the layers uh, that you can see going down are the layers in the radical filtration. Okay. Um, if you want the post and the modules, you just turn off the diagrams upside down, which is not something that happens in every highest grade category, but it's something you get quite often. Okay. Any, uh, any questions about this example? Okay. Not then. Let me just mention something that I already said in the introduction, but. Um, you, you get more examples if you're looking at uh, rational representations. Representations of reductive algebra groups. Um, or if you look at uh, representations of flat smoothie algebras. And there's a small subtlety here, namely, in order to get the kind of highest grade category that I'm talking about, you need to look at the blocks at negative level. Um, or you can look at quantum groups at root affinity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, this is all the basics I want to talk about for uh, high space categories. And now, um, the next important concept before I can introduce minimal tilting complexes is the concept of tilting modules, which already show up in the name of the thing that I actually want to talk about filtrations and tilting modules. Tilting modules. And uh, well, this is a definition which is not very spectacular, but it's very useful. Namely, we say that um, a 
delta filtration of an object can exceed this filtration. that each of the successive portions is going to be isomorphic to one of the vectors. So mi modulo mi minus one is, um, is isomorphic to delta lambda i sine lambda i lambda Um, then similarly, uh, another filtration is defined as a filtration uh, like so, where all the successive portions are going to be isomorphic to torsional objects with some highest weights and not going to write this down. And then finally, um, an object which admits both a delta and another filtration is called a tilting object. Okay, so uh, what's good about tilting objects is um, that we actually have a complete classification of all tilting objects, and that's uh, due to Ringel. And uh, he tells us that um, for lambda, um, it is unique. Object T lambda C such that um, the composition multiplicity well okay, let me say different this unique tilting object T lambda, which is in C less or equal lambda, so all the all the composition factors are going to be of highest weight lambda or smaller, uh, such that the composition multiplicity of the highest possible weight is just equal. Okay. Um, and furthermore, every tilting object sum of the indecomposable theta modulus of the four. Okay, so this gives you a complete classification of all the tilting objects because we know that every tilting object is going to be some finite direct sum of indecomposables and all the indecomposables look as described by Ringer and Steele. So they're, they're classified by the highest weight. And so in, in principle, to a set of 
distinguished object of the category, the simplest uh, standards and coastmaps, you can now add a fourth class of distinguished objects, which can play an important role in these objects and be composed with these objects. Um, okay. Um, and uh, right, I want to I want to give you some examples an idea of what to think about today. I mean, I, I gave you I gave you an existing statement. So now in the framework of the example we were looking at earlier, I can tell you what the filter models are going to look like. Um, and well, the first one is quite easy. So we've seen earlier that um, in category O, zero for V equals the three of C, um, the Verma module um, is the same as the simple module. Mm -hmm. And I, I told you that the, the dual Verma module is the same, but just turned around. So the same as not by E, okay? Um, but now that means that the simple module has both a delta filtration and another filtration, so it's actually the same for the simple module. Mm -hmm. okay, so this is easy. Um, for, uh, for the simple reflections, it's also fairly easy. Um, let me explain that um, they are basically a non split extension of delta S by delta E. So we get an E on top. And then we get an S E mm -hmm. underneath, and this is a non-split extension by delta S down here, delta E at the top. But now, if you look at the filtration the other way around, then you can see that this here is actually nabla S, and this here is nabla E. Mm -hmm. okay. And the same thing for T, which is just going to be E. Um, and then I'm going to draw one for you that is slightly more complicated than the T. ST, and I'm going to highlight the, the delta filtration in it. So you get delta ST at the bottom. E. This, this is delta ST, this is delta T, this is delta S, this is delta E. And so this is a delta filtration. But you can see that the structure of the module would remain the same if you flip it the other way around, so it would also have another filtration. Mm -hmm. This is not a proof, of course. But essentially, this is also how you construct these modules. You start from the standard module of the correct highest weight, and you glue on more standard modules until eventually you reach a tilting module. Mm -hmm. And like the, the fact that this works follows completely from the action. Okay, any questions on this? If not, then I'll, I'll move on to well, the main thing I, that I was hoping to talk about, and that's minimal filter complexes. Um, and um, well, before, before I tell you what minimal fitting complexes are, I need to point out one very important additional property of, uh, of fitting of the objects in high stress categories. And uh, this um, property essentially tells you that fitting objects control all of the homological algebra of the abelian category you're looking at. Um, and this works as follows. So I'm telling you the canonical functor. from the bounded homotopy category of tilting objects in C to the bounded derived category of the real category C um, is an equivalence. Of triangulated categories. Down. So this here is the full set category of tilting objects C. This here is the bounded homotopy category, and this here is the bounded direct category. So um, why am I telling you that this encapsulates all the homological algebra of the category? Well, essentially, 
um, the derived category encapsulates all the homological algebra because all the X groups are going to arise as home spaces in such a situation. And now, um, the, um, this homotopy category is basically the homotopy category of an additive category, which is fairly easy to understand, at least in the sense that we know all the indecomposable objects because they're classified by this theorem. Mm -hmm. okay? um, and but in a way that tells you that tilting objects provide a replacement for projectives in this category, because in the highest weight category, you do not automatically have projectives. But in the category where you have projectives, the same statement is true if you replace tilting by projective, at least if you change the boundedness conditions a little bit. Okay. Um, uh, one more thing, the reason why this is true is essentially that all the higher X groups between tilting objects vanish. And that follows from the X vanishing statement. So I told you earlier that all higher X between standard and co-standard vanishes. Um, and because tilting objects have both a delta filtration and an alpha filtration, that means that also all the higher X between tilting objects vanishes. And this is basically the key step in, in the tool. Uh, but I don't want to go into more detail. So um, now, um, OK, what does, what does this, this tell us? Um, uh, one thing it tells us is basically that um, whenever okay, we it's this. Um, so we're going to have our abelian category, our highest weight category that, we, uh, that we're interested in as a canonical functor into the direct category where you just send an object to the complex that is itself into be 0 and nothing out of it. Mm -hmm. um, that means that um, when you're given an object of the highest weight category, it's going to have a pre-image mm -hmm. of this factor, which is some bound complex of tilting modules, which is isomorphic to M in the direct category. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, there's going to be uh, some complex C, which is mapped to M under this factor. So, uh, this here is bound complex. C such that um, C is isomorphic to M in the derived category of C. Mm -hmm. And maybe if you're not so comfortable with derived categories, let me just tell you that this condition, this isomorphism, is actually equivalent to the requirement that the cohomology groups of this complex C, so if you take the complex, you take kernel modulo, modulo image of the differential, uh, that this should just give you m in degree 0 and 0 everywhere else. So this is actually a very, very easy um, cohomology condition on what this complex needs to satisfy. Mm -hmm. And uh, furthermore, the additional thing that you get from this equivalence is that uh, C is unique up to homotopy equivalence. Yeah, well, in the end, homotopy equivalence is just isomorphism in the homotopy. So this is basically. Since this is an equivalence, the preimage of M is unique to this model. Okay. And the idea behind minimal tilting complexes is that we want something better than unique up to homotopy equivalence. We want this to be unique up to an isomorphism of complexes. So we had an additional requirement on our complex, and we are going to get something unique. Um, we need some more space to explain how we do that.
Oh, sorry, Jonathan, can you push the, the bottom board up? All the, up, up, even all the, the way up. up. All the way up. Yeah. There we go. I'm going to down. There we go. Okay, so uh, we say that a complex in the category of tilting modules of a C uh, is minimal. No isomorphism between indecomposable tilting objects vectors through any differential. So uh, what that means is if you look at your complex in PI, PI plus one, you can never have a situation where you have uh, T lambda sitting here and the identity on T lambda factors of the definition of the complex. Okay. So this is this we're not allowed to have. Um, okay. And by the way, the reason we're interested in is that these things actually exist. Um, uh, every homotopy class of bound complexes And essentially, the way by which this is achieved is that um, when you start from you start from a non-minimal complex, let's just say, so it's going to be of the form you're going to have some ti prime plus t lambda, uh, t i plus one prime plus t lambda, mm -hmm. and the differential between them is going to be some matrix d11, uh, d12, d21, and then identity morphism. Okay, so this is what it looks like. And essentially what you can do to this complex is you do a Gaussian elimination, mm -hmm. um, by which you, you eliminate, eliminate d12 and d21 and replace them by zero. So you can rewrite this um, as uh, so let's say B i plus T lambda B i plus one plus T lambda where uh, where you put a an identity D two one identity zero, so you put a lower triangular matrix identity minus D one two zero identity, and down here we're going to get a diagonal matrix, uh, psi and uh, identity, where uh, psi is defined as d11 minus d21 composed with d12. Okay, so we have this Gaussian elimination uh, on complexes. And because we start from bounded complex, uh, if we iterate this process, we'll eventually arrive at a, at a minimal complex from whatever complex we start from. Um, so this is basically the existence part of the proof. Now, the existence part of the proof of this result. There's also a uniqueness part, which I'm not going to explain now for time reasons. Um, but um, yeah, maybe let me, let me give you a few examples. Um, okay, now one, one thing maybe is okay. Um, okay, so going up here. Um, so I told you that um, you have a unique homotopy class of complexes, which is basically the preimages of M on this factor. Um, 
So in this homotopy class, uh, there's going to be a unique minimal, com a minimal complex which you get by uh, Gaussian elimination. And this is what we call the minimal filter complex of M, and we write it C min. Okay, so this is minimal filtering complex. Um, this is the unique uh, up to isomorphism uh, bounded minimal complex C such that uh, the cohomology satisfies precisely the conditions that I wrote down before, such as H I of C is more equal to M in degree zero and zero in degree not zero. Okay, so this this is the definition of the complex. Are there questions about the definition? So if not um, then I'm running short on time. Um, let me let me just tell you. Uh, well, one one thing is I want to tell you why these things are useful, and I just want to give you an example of how you can sort of read off cohomological information from the minimal tilting complex. Uh, and there is the lemma that says that a module M has a, a delta filtration uh, if and only if all the terms of the minimal filtering complex in negative degree are zero. Okay, a similar filtration, a uh, similar criterion for Nabla filtration, we just turn the condition around. And so the, the complex, how, the, how far the complex draws into the negative or positive source measures how far a module is away from having a delta filtration or another filtration. Um, and then, uh, Finally, if you're, if you're in concrete examples, like sort of category O, it's actually often possible to explicitly compute the minimal tilting complexes. And this is the last thing that I want to talk about. Uh, namely, uh, in O0, um, we can, um, well, we can look at the minimal tilting complex uh, of a uh, say a Burma module, um, and where well, we might be interested in the terms of this complex. Okay, so we, we say we look at C, like the, the term in degree i, and we want to know uh, which tilting module it is. So we want to know how it decomposes the direct sum of indecomposable tilting modules. So let's just ask about the multiplicity of an indecomposable tilting module Qi in there, we'd like to understand all of these multiplicities, and we can take them all together and turn them into polynomial boundaries of all integers. Um, and now, um, this thing is something we can actually compute. Um, namely, it's actually, uh, well, it's an inverse Kaldanusti polynomial. Normal um, for the value group which the Cox star group, so it has an associated Kaldanusti polynomials. Um, and we can also compute this for the minimal hidden complexes of the simples. So if you write down the same polynomial, but you replace um, the Werner module by a simple module, we get minimal hidden complex of Lx. Uh, in I, the multiplicity of the tilting module to Y as a direct sum end, multiply this with P to the I, then um, this is going to be a sum of all elements of the Y group. Uh, we take H, Z, X, bar times H, Z, Y, um, where as before, this is an inverse Kaldanustic polynomial. This here is a Kaldanustic polynomial 
and um, bar is the ring homomorphism from the Laurent polynomial ring uh, to itself, which stands uh, B to B inverse. So in concrete examples like category O, we can explicitly compute this. And we can also explicitly compute this for quantum groups or for Plasmodi algebras. Uh, for reductive algebraic groups and positive characteristic this is an open problem. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, mean, I think I'll uh, stop here. <laughs> I'm sorry if I couldn't follow that. Like, once you try to find units in a minimal complex, then um, you do a lot of elimination. Yeah. What guarantees that you have like lower triangular matrix or upper triangular matrix? I mean, is there a possibility that like rows are uh, not independent? Um, in in the proof, you mean? Yeah. I, this is basically okay. Sorry, I think I wasn't quite clear here. Um, what the idea is that. Um, if we have a non-minimal complex, mm -hmm. it's it's going to, so the, the complex in the top row is going to be isomorphic to the complex in the bottom row, because these triangular matrices are invertible. Okay. okay. But now, the differentials, like the the cross terms in the differential between the vi's and the t lambdas, are zero, which means that the complex in the bottom row it splits as a direct sum of a complex that looks like I mean vi. Bi plus one something, and the complex where you have zero, t lambda, t lambda, zero. So because this differential looks like this, uh, the complex in the bottom row is just the direct sum of this complex with this complex. But this complex is isomorphic to zero in the homotopy category. Mm -hmm. So that means we haven't changed the homotopy class, and we've gone from a bigger complex that had some redundancy in its differential to a smaller complex with less redundancy. And if you if you iterate this process, you eventually remove all the redundancy. Yeah, my, my knowledge of uh, linear theory is kind of in a different background, uh, basic association of algebra. And so like, not, is it correct to think about minimal tilting models as simply you just make all the multiplicities equal to one in that case, or not? Um, in my, like in your direct sum decomposition of t lambda uh, uh, and m lambda times, because it seemed like you're just peeling off repeated factors of the t lambda. Um, so uh, you you can sort of peel off one factor at a time, but in principle there may be more than one indecomposable. You have to pe peel off right, each right. term. So, so is, is a minimal like from a uh, module theory example, it, it is the minimal. Uh, tilting module simply basically keep the indecomposable somehow, but you just go ahead and make all the multiplicities equal to one? No. Okay. So in principle, you have minimal complexes where the multiplicity of a given indecomposable in a given degree is more than one. Mm -hmm. um, okay. What happens in the examples where you sort of have a cartesian lustig theory, so in this setting, what's going to happen is that um, if, uh, if a tilting module T lambda appears in a given degree, it's not going to appear in the neighboring degrees. Mm. This is, it doesn't follow from the definition. In principle, it would be possible that you have T lambda in these two degrees, but the map that the differential induces between them is just not an isomorphism. Um, but the like, cartesian lustig polynomials have very nice parity properties, and they tell you that if, say, Ty shows up in a given even degree, then it can only ever show up in even degrees, mm -hmm. or odd degrees, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and with the, like, at least in the case of like the uh, basic associative algebra, like, the, the range is always the same, whereas it is, isn't the case here. And so I'm wondering, like, is there any interest from the combinatorial perspective, like looking at partial tilting modules, meaning like they can be completed to a part, to a, completed to a tilting module, and asking yourself like the number of ways that you could do it, and the, um, but like that, like take a something that is not quite a tilting module, but could be completed by adding n extra factors, and the number of ways you could do that to create a tilting module. So when you say factors, you mean direct sum? Direct sum. Sorry, sorry, sorry. 
So it's quite cool because like direct some adding direct summons can never give you a tilting module. Basically by classification result, everything everything that's a tilting module is a direct sum of any composable tilting modules. So I mean basically I guess it is a reasonable question to ask how you can build the tilting modules out of the out of the standard modules. So like given the module with the delta filtration, how much do you need to add in order to get a tilting module? Um, in the very, like in the completely abstract setting, I think this is too hard to answer. I think in, the, in like if you're giving yourself some concrete examples, this is a reasonable question. So do you think this this theorem, well, in the characteristic P reductive group case, um, will be related to P casualistic polynomials? Mm. So. I'm not entirely sure because something that happens with basically what we know about this this question here is because of, because of the lemma, yeah. this polynomial here, which in principle is a Laurent polynomial because the minimal tilting complex might have terms in negative and in positive degrees, yeah. is an honest polynomial that only lives in non-negative degrees. Okay. But there are p cartonistic polynomials which have the negative powers of the variable occurring mm -hmm. within. So it can't be the peak, like the, they can't be the correct answer, but they might be related to the correct answer. Right. So for P very, very large, then you can actually do this, is that correct? Um, because we know the list of character one and all the time. Yeah, so it, and if you haven't thought about whether or not this goes through, the the way this this is proven is yeah. you, you pass to the ring the dual of the highest weight category. Okay. Um, and then you can identify these multiplicities with dimensions of X groups. Right. Now the X groups between coastal objects and simple objects. Mm -hmm. If you do this in the case of category O, the, the principal block, the ring dual is just category O again. Right. And then the dimensions of X groups are coefficients of cartonistic polynomials. Yes. This is where the theorem comes from. Right. Um, so basically, if you, you what you need to do is you need to look at the ringle dual of the principal block yeah. of re rational representations, uh -huh. um, and then you need to compute dimensions of x groups in this ringle dual, I which I think is very hard. Like, yeah. I mean, basically the the ringle dual is what is described by uh, Jody Williamson and Ben Elias Zergel calculus. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, you need to use Zergel calculus. Like, like the if you if you look at their monoidal categories and you glue them together into an algebra, mm -hmm. then modules over this algebra is going to be the ringle dual of the thing about to like of the principal block of representations of algebraic groups. Mm -hmm. And basically, in order to find out this question in the setting you are asking about, you need to understand the representations of Zergel calculus. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Other questions? Oh, let's thank the speaker.